Hey class, how's it going? This is Walter here. We're gonna be going over week nine psychosis. So just like the other lectures, I'm gonna be watching my video from last semester. If I see something I wanna change or I wanna edit, then I'll go ahead and do that. Here's a quick word from our corporate sponsors. So let's hear what they have to say and then we'll get into the lecture. Nobody's gonna know. Nobody's gonna know. They're gonna know. How would they know? How would they know? How would they know? I can't. I can't. I just, I can't. Oh my god! All right. There we go. Great job, everybody. So now we're gonna go ahead and get into the lecture. I'm gonna go ahead and get this video started. I'm gonna jump out the way, and then we're just gonna listen to what's going on here. If I wanna update anything, I'll pause the video. You know how this works out, let's get it going. Good morning, class. We're gonna go ahead and begin our week nine lecture on schizophrenia and related disorders. This is going to be a very long lecture, so if you're just starting this right now, buckle up, uh, get some coffee, get something to eat, and get ready. This is gonna be a very long lecture. And just to give you a heads up, our next lecture that's gonna be week uh, 10 and 11, it's gonna be combined into a single video that's gonna go over all of personality disorders. So if you want to, you can watch that one all at once or you can break it up. All right, I'll leave that up to you. So let's go ahead and get started here. So what are some common misconceptions about schizophrenia that you've heard? So right over here, here's some common air instructors that I found where people have these different misconceptions about what schizophrenia is. You know, someone being locked up in a padded cell, uh, somebody being close to a, psych a psychiatric hospital, somebody talking to themselves. These are like some common misconceptions that you'll often see portrayed in the media or other outlets about schizophrenia and what it actually means to be schizophrenic. In this lecture, what I hope to do is educate you on what schizophrenia is, talk about some of the symptoms, talk about the treatments and everything like that, but also maybe to dispel some of the stigma that surrounds schizophrenia for those of you who might have schizophrenia yourselves or have relatives um, with schizophrenia. So our agenda for today is going to be talking about the symptoms, talk a little bit about differential diagnosis, we'll get into the etiology and the course of schizophrenia, talk about epidemiology, and we'll talk about treatments. So over here, we have groups of symptoms, positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and disorganized systems. So we're going to go through all of these um, in the following slides. So positive symptoms are going to be things that are normally absent in most people, but are present in the individual with, with schizophrenia. So in other words, what this means, it is something that is added to the person's experience. So this is gonna be like seeing things that aren't there or believing things that are happening that aren't actually happening. So negative symptoms, these are gonna be aspects of behavior and social relationships that are normally present, but are absent in this individual with schizophrenia. In other words, this is gonna be something that is taking away. So this is gonna be aspects of behavior or social relationships that are normally present, but absent in the individual. You see delusions, these are positive symptoms. Most people do not experience delusions. So this is something that is added. Hallucinations, seeing things, hearing things that aren't actually there. Most people don't have hallucinations. This is not a part of normal experience. So this is something is added to the individual. So right over here, we have anhedonia. What is anhedonia? Loss of pleasure. So I used to enjoy this thing. I don't anymore. Blunted or flat affect. That means I'm very monotone, not a lot of expressions, not a lot of emotions. Alosia. This is going to be a lack of speech. So I used to speak a lot, but now I really don't speak. I'm not really saying anything. I'm not responsive. Avolition. So avolition, this is going to be, you know, not moving, a lack of movement, lack of motion. And asociality, this is going to be a lack of connection to other people, a lack of social behavior behaviors. And the last category we have right here is disorganized symptoms. So these disorganized symptoms, these reflect a person's inability to like think clearly and respond appropriately. So right over here, we have like disorganized speech, uh, disorganized behavior, or even catatonic behavior. And we'll get into more about what catatonic behavior is later on. What I will say is this, if you're very interested in catatonic behavior, watch some of the study videos that we have on Compass and also do a little bit of scholar.google.com searching and gets a more in-depth view on catatonic behavior. So let's get 
right into it when it comes to positive symptoms. Let's talk about some positive symptoms. Let's start off with these delusions right here. Delusions are false ideas, right? and these are false beliefs, false ideas that are fixed, and they're not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. This is not gonna be, oh, I like cookies and cream ice cream. It's not like an, an opinion. This isn't, oh, Blitz was better than Mr. Glass. You know, it's not gonna be like, or Glass. It's not, it's not gonna be like one of those type of things. This is gonna be a bizarre type of belief. It's gonna be very strange and completely implausible, and it's not gonna be understandable or relatable to some kind of in your culture or even to peers within like a subculture. And this is not derived from like ordinary life experiences. So this delusion is gonna be very bizarre. So an example of a bizarre delusion is going to be a belief that like an outside force has removed your internal organs and replaced them with somebody else's organs without like leaving any kind of wounds or scars or something like that, right? When someone like came in, took out my organs, replaced it with somebody else's organs or replaced it with like a machine or something. There's other types of delusions, non-bizarre delusions. These are gonna be believing that you are being spied on, believing that someone is secretly in love with you, uh, believing that you are great but unrecognized in like your art or your craft, or believing that your spouse is cheating on you despite lack of evidence. Bizarre delusions, these are things that could, could really like never happen. But they're outside the realm of possibility. But a non-bizarre delusion, it's still unlikely it's still probably not true. It's still a falsely held belief, but it is persecutory delusions. This is the belief that one is being attacked, harassed, cheated, persecuted, or conspired against by an individual or organization. There's referential delusions. This is belief that gestures, comments are directed towards the self or have a particular or unusual significance. Grandiose delusions. So this is belief that one has exceptional abilities knowledge, wealth, or power, or has a special relationship to a deity or a famous person. There are delusions of guilt. So this is a belief that a minor error in the past will lead to a disaster, or that they have committed a horrible crime and should be punished severely, or that they are responsible for a disaster in which there is no possible connection. Erotomanic delusions. So this is a false belief that someone is in love with you. This is usually about someone of like a higher status, like a very famous person, a very powerful person, very rich person. There is nihilistic delusions. This is a belief that a major catastrophe will occur, the belief that either you or the world doesn't exist. There are somatic delusions. This is belief that one has a serious health and or organ problems. Religious delusions this is a delusion that has like a, a religious or a spiritual content based on some kind of like spiritual belief. Delusions of being controlled. So this could be feelings, impulses, thoughts, or actions that the individual believes are under the control of some external force rather than their own control. Then we have thought insertion. This is the belief that certain thoughts are not one's own, but rather inserted into their mind. Thought withdrawal, that thoughts have been removed by some outside force. Okay, then there's thought broadcasting, which is the belief that one's thoughts are being broadcast out loud so other people can hear them. Okay, so I know that it was a lot right there, but if you have any questions about any of that, send me an email, come to office hours. If you're looking for some examples, things like that, we can talk about it. If, not, if that didn't make sense to you, just let me know. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look right here, some review, a little, a little bit of a practice question. So why do we call some symptoms of schizophrenia positive and others negative? Okay, let's take a look at this. Positive symptoms are good experiences associated with the disorder, while negative symptoms are bad. Positive symptoms are experiences that most people don't have, while negative symptoms are the absence of experiences that most people do have. Positive symptoms must be present for a diagnosis, indicating that someone is positive for the disorder, while the presence of negative symptoms means someone is negative for the disorder. Positive symptoms are associated with a better prognosis than negative symptoms. And to remain consistent with PEMDAS, we know that we, we must know what order to put the symptoms into the schizophrenia aid. You'll see there that on this practice question, E was something that I throw in there from time to time in the participation points. It's gobbledygook, it's nonsense, it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't come from anything, it's just there to distract you. That is something that you will find in some of our quizzes. This is almost like hyperbole when I do this. Some of the quiz answers are so wrong, you should know that they're wrong. So just think about that when you're taking these uh, participation points, but also when you're doing the reading quizzes or when you're taking the larger quizzes. You know, if you really don't know the material, you might be drawn to some of these questions. Just keep that in mind when you're looking at some of these participation points. In equation, A, B, C, D, or E. All right, so let's go ahead and think about that for a second. You already know what's going on here. This is the video, press pause, whatever, figure it out. You know, bam, boom, it's B. 
Positive symptoms are experiences that most people don't have, while negative symptoms are the absence of experiences that most people do have. I want you to remember that a positive symptom is something that is added, and a negative symptom is something that is taken away or absent. So something that is added is positive. Something that's taken away is negative. So this is not talking about whether this is a good symptom or bad symptom or if it feels good or it feels bad or it's not talking about that. It's talking about is this something that is added to the individual's experience or is this something that is taken away from the individual's experience? That's what we're talking about here. So let's move on to hallucinations. This is another positive symptom. These hallucinations are going to be very vivid and clear experiences, like just like a normal perception, right? And it's not going to be something that someone can like induce themselves. It's not under voluntary control. So this is going to be like you are experiencing something that is very clear. It's very vivid. It's like it's actually happening. You did not try to make this happen. This is happening to you. And so this can happen any of the five uh, senses. So let's take a look right here. So you got visual hallucinations. Hallucinations. This is seeing something that's not actually there. Auditory hallucinations. Hearing something. Hearing someone's voice or sound that doesn't actually exist. Olfactory hallucinations. Smelling something that is not actually there. Uh, we have uh, gustatory. So tasting something that is not actually there. And tactile feeling something that's not actually there. This is gonna be a little bit different than a mild experience. Because this happens sometimes, right? You'll be walking around and then you'll see something and then it will remind you of something that happened in the past. So for example, you might see somebody fall down on a skateboard and hit their knee. You might go, ooh, like you go, oh, I can almost feel that, right? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, that hurts. That, that's, that's not a hallucination. That's just you seeing somebody going through something and feeling like, oh, snaps. Like, I, I know how that feels. So, for example, I'm walking down the street and I see Chipotle. I'm like, man, I know that barbacoa is slamming, you know, and I can taste it. You know what I'm talking about? You can taste the barbacoa. You're like, mm, 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 mm. you can taste the barbacoa. You know what I'm saying? This is not the same thing. This is totally different. So this has to be something that is very like it's very real. It is a perception-like experience. That part right over here, the external stimulus part, that's very important. So it's not like me looking at something and then reminding myself of something. And it's just I'm walking down the street and then boom, I'm put into these different states of experiences. That doesn't make sense to you? Red box on DSM-5, come to office hours. That's how that works. All right, so right over here, we're going to have a video that's going to talk a little bit about hallucinations coming up next, about auditory hallucinations. I do want to make a very clear distinction right here. For auditory hallucinations, these are usually voices perceived as being distinct from the individual's own thoughts. All of us hear voices in our head, like Jiminy Cricket, right? That's your conscious. Always let your conscious be your guide, okay? So you, you hear voices in your head, right? You hear your friend's voices, your mom's voices, random voices, made up voices. You hear those in your head. But these hallucinations are different. These are experience, not as coming from your head, but as coming from outside of your head, like through your ears. Like you can feel like this voice is interacting with your ears and you know the difference. And you know the difference between thinking somebody saying something and then hearing somebody saying something. So here's what I want you to do. Let's do a little experiment here real quick. All right. I want you to think about elephants. I want you to say elephant in your head 10 times. I want you to say elephant in your head. Now you, you, you experience that, right? You experience that, right? Like you're saying elephant in your head, right? You can hear the word elephant in your head. Now I'm gonna say elephant. Elephant, 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 elephant. Do you see the difference? Do you feel the difference there? So when somebody has an auditory hallucination, they experience that as if somebody is talking to them directly. Okay. So let's go ahead and watch this video real quick. I'm going to hop out the way and I'll be right back. Just to give you a heads up. Some of these videos are causing my YouTube links to get blocked and flagged. Oprah got super mad at me for having her video on the last lecture. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to skip past this video segment and then just go back to me after what the, watching the video. All of these videos are posted on the compass page in the study videos folder, which I can see how many people have not been watching those videos, which is fine. I'll just go to the part which shows the star of the video just so you can see what it looks like and then you can go to the study page and watch the rest of it. Hello.
My name is Cecilia Miguel. This is the video you're gonna watch. Go to the study videos folder on Compass, watch Celia's video talking about schizophrenia. Now we're gonna go ahead and continue with the lecture. A monster. Thank you. As you saw in that video right there, schizophrenia is, is, a, is a mental disorder, but that doesn't mean you can't leave a normal life or should they lead a normal life. Also, you're gonna see some of the stigma there about schizophrenia. So, you know, the police came to pick her up and take her into a police car to, for a psych ward stay. We see some of the teasing that goes on and, you know, some of the uh, the side eye that happens when people have schizophrenia or present schizophrenic symptoms. We also talk a little bit about the, heard a little bit about the media portrayal of schizophrenia and how it's not really accurate and how, you know, people try to label schizophrenics as uh, monsters and things like that. Or, you know, call people psycho killers. You ever heard that term? Psycho killer? What do you think that's talking about? So it's talking about people with psychosis. That's what it's talking about. And so there's a lot of ways that we we further along these mental health, stigmas of mental health without even thinking about it. So I challenge you to watch that video, maybe watch it again, maybe look out some other personal statements or personal narratives about schizophrenia and try to think about where in your life you might have had some of these not so good beliefs. Really examine yourself, really dig deep and then think about it. You know, don't, don't just take this like a, as a class, take this as a way for you to think about your yourself as a person. Here we have the negative symptoms associated with schizophrenia. A good way to look at this is with a little bit of a mnemonic. I think it's a mnemonic. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. The five A's. We have abolition, affect, anhedonia, elogia, and asociality. Those would be the five A's of negative symptoms for schizophrenia. Let's go ahead and take a look at all five of these, but I do want to highlight one thing before we get started, that the two negative symptoms that are the most prominent in schizophrenia are going to be blunted flat affect and abolition. These, these are, this is pr particularly dominant in schizophrenia. Let's look at um, abolition real quick here. So abolition is the lack of willpower or volition to initiate and persist in goal-directed activities. This is a little bit different than how you feel five o'clock on Friday. This is a persistent thing. Now let's talk about blunted flat affect. This is going to include diminished emotional expression. So this is like reductions in the expressions of emotions in the face, eye contact, reductions in the intonation of speech. This is also known as prosody. This is also going to include reduction in movements of the hands, movements of the head, and movements of the face that typically give some kind of a normal, give some kind of a, an emotional emphasis to speech. Although schizophrenia patients show less outwardly expressed emotion, research actually indicates that they report feeling similar levels of subjective mood as normal people. And those I'm doing this when I say that, you know. So if you're listening to this as a podcast, like I'm putting my air quotes up, you know what I'm talking about? Don't cancel me on Twitter. This means that when somebody with schizophrenia is presented with either negative or positive emotional stimuli, their subjective mood is concordant with those without schizophrenia. So you might say that there might be a dissociation or some kind of disentanglement between emotional feeling, or should say the experience of emotion and the expression of emotion in patients with schizophrenia. So let's move down to anhedonia. We know what anhedonia is from our mood disorders lectures. So anhedonia is a loss of pleasure. So you used to enjoy doing certain things, you don't anymore. This is gonna be the inability to experience pleasure with, with like new events or the events you usually enjoyed. Let's talk about elogia. So elogia is gonna be a decreased, decreased speech. This is going to mean you're going to have little spontaneous speech, or if you're asked a question, you're going to respond very briefly. Elogia means like loss of speech. That's what a logia without words. All right, or should I say without speech. I don't want to get canceled on academic Twitter. So now let's talk about asociality. Asociality is the lack of interest in social interactions. This means that you are not really interested in forming relationships. These could be friendships, this could be family relationships, this could be romantic relationships, sexual relationships. You have a lack of interest in social interactions, asociality. All right, so now let's, let's go over the disorganized symptoms. Disorganized speech and grossly disorganized bizarre behavior. Those are gonna be our two disorganized symptoms that we're gonna talk about and they present themselves in a variety of ways. So right over here, let's go ahead and take a look at 
disorganized speech. An individual might switch from like one topic to another. This is known as derailment or loose associations. So answer to the questions might be obliquely related or completely unrelated. This is tangentiality. Um, so rarely spe speech might be um, so severely disorganized that it is nearly incomprehensible. So this is otherwise gonna be known as word salad. So word salad consists of a random stream of seemingly unconnected words. This could be something like pots, dogs, small is tabled. Because mildly disorganized speech is common and uh, nonspecific, this symptom must be severe enough to substantially impair effective communication. Let's just go over this one more time here. So we have the derailment, loose associations. This is gonna be switching from one topic to another. You're gonna have the tangentiality, circumstantiality. These, these things are not really related. You're kind of making a reach. And then speech is incomprehensible, a word salad. You can't really understand the person is saying. This occurs in both individuals with psychosis and individuals without psychosis. But when it comes to looking for a diagnosis, this is going to be, this word salad needs to be severe enough to where you can't even understand what the person's talking about. Let's move down to grossly disorganized behaviors. So this is gonna range from a like childlike silliness, unpredictable agitation. This could be problems preparing a meal or keeping up personal hygiene. You might think of this also as being like different kinds of dress that are inappropriate to the weather or the, the occasion. This could also be a display of inappropriate sexual behavior or unpredictable agitation. Let's talk a little bit about catatonic behavior. Canada, catatonic behavior is going to be a marked decrease in reactivity to the environment. So this is gonna range from resistance to instructions, which is known as negativism, to maintaining a rigid, inappropriate, or biz bizarre posture, uh, to a complete lack of verbal and motor responses. A complete lack of verbal responses is mutism, and a complete lack of motor responses is gonna be stupor. It can be stereotype movements as well. This might be things like staring, grimacing, mutism, echoing a speech. Just keep in mind we have three main things there with his catatonic behavior. You have negativism, mutism, stupor, and catatonic excitement. That was a lot right there. If you do have questions about that, you can go ahead and send me an email or come to office hours. So patient Y often sees shadows that other people do not see and they get unusual physical sensations. So this is the feeling of bugs crawling on the skin, the feeling of electricity. In addition to this, their speech lacks spontaneity and is relatively expressionless for most of the duration of a four to five hour therapy session, which is true. So we have patient Y is exhibiting only positive symptoms. Patient Y was exhibiting only negative symptoms. Patient Y was exhibiting only disorganized symptoms. Patient Y was the exhibiting both positive and negative symptoms. Patient Y was exhibiting both negative and disorganized symptoms. A, B, C, D, E, O. These kind of questions are gonna be a lot more common moving forward on the quizzes. We just had quiz number three, and then we're gonna have quiz four, five, and six left. I'm hoping you're taking all the quizzes. Remember, the lowest score drops at the end of the semester, and if you have a zero, that's your lowest score. But you're gonna see more questions like this. This is going to require you to understand what the disorder is, what it isn't, to understand the meaning of these terms. Memorization is cool. It helps you to memorize things. Yeah, I get it. It's better if you understand what a symptom is and how it operates. And so you can like look at a, a paragraph like this and then pull the symptoms out and determine what kind of disorder the individual has. On these quizzes, you're not gonna see practice questions that are gonna be on the quiz. You're not gonna see reading questions on the quiz. You're gonna have content and material that is covered in the reading, covered in the lectures. It's going to show itself on the quiz. And sometimes you're gonna put two and two together and then come up with your own answer. So you have to figure it out. It's gonna require you to understand the material to a high level. If you are confused about that, you don't know how to make that happen, send me an email, come to office hours, come to the in-person discussion sessions, go to the DSM-5, look at the little salmon colored boxes and get some tips there what's going on. Push yourself, really try. Learn a little something in the class, kind of better yourself, kind of the point of education. You already know what it is. Let's take a look. It's D. Patient Y was exhibiting both positive and negative symptoms. The positive symptoms would be the hallucinations. There's visual hallucinations here, also somatic hallucinations right here. We have the seeing the shadows and the bugs crawling on the skin and electricity. Here we also see that there is a lack of speech, alosia, so that is a negative symptom. So patient Y was exhibiting both positive and negative symptoms. So right over here, we have a continuum 
of psychosis. We all experience these types of symptoms, these types of behaviors from time to time. There might be periods of time when you are not speaking very much. There might be periods of time where you are very lethargic. And there's periods of time where, you know, you might dress inappropriately. When I say inappropriate, I mean like inappropriate to the occasion or inappropriate to the weather, not like making kind of moral judgment there. This continuum here where we go from behavior that is within cultural norms to behavior that goes fully psychotic. And as we see right here, you can exist anywhere along this continuum. Just because you are not fully psychotic doesn't mean that you don't have distress. So you can still have distress with lower or attenuated sub-threshold psychosis. So as, we, as I've tried to say repeatedly, Sub-threshold number and levels of symptoms can still cause significant distress and impairment. So just because you don't meet diagnostic criteria doesn't necessarily mean that you are unbothered. So go ahead and press pause right here, look through it, read through it. Have any questions on this, send me an email. All right, so right over here, let's talk a little bit about an example of the psychosis continuum. Let's talk about ghosts. I ain't afraid of no ghosts. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I just got demonetized. Okay, so we can have things about cultural considerations, for ghosts, your reactions to ghosts are within cultural norms. You saw a ghost one time, you thought it was a loved one who'd recently passed, so you felt comforted. There was no change on your behavior, and this is consistent with your family's beliefs, right? So right over here, this is within the cultural norms. So there's no distress, this is infrequent aware, or rare. There is a no effect on your behavior or functioning. It's consistent with your cultural beliefs. So let's think about that for a second, right? Think about your cultural beliefs, whether that's uh, ethnic identity, religion, national origin, whatever it is. Uh, think about the conceptualization of ghosts. I saw my guardian angel or, you know, the saint or the deity that I prayed to um, came and visited me and that was cool and I just kept it, kept it pushing. So then over here, now things get a little more serious. The next step up might be something where the frequency is a little, has been increased. Maybe there's some distress involved with this experience or it begins to bother other people. Starting to feel a little weird about it, but you're still questioning reality. Once again, not really a lot of a big effect on your behavior. This is where like you're seeing ghosts, maybe like a few times a month. You're not sure why. Um, you don't think it's real, but you're starting to get scared, a little bit nervous, getting harder to fall asleep. And this is not consistent with your family's beliefs. Then you could have the next step up is going to be increase, increase from like weekly to daily. So there's a lot more distress going on. This starts to feel real to you because this keeps happening. You're like wrapped up in your covers, talking about I see dead people, but you're not, you're not really convinced that this is real, but it's starting to see a lot more, seem a lot more real to you. So this could be starting to affect your behavior and impact your function. So right over here, we have this good example. Now, a few times a week, you're seeing somebody you feel like maybe it's the dead trying to communicate with you. You're very scared. Um, this is very disturbing to you. Or on the flip side, you're thinking that, hey man, you know, I've been taking my vitamins, eating my Wheaties, now I have this special gift. And you know, I can communicate with ghosts, I can help guide them to the spirit world. I just saw Ouija Origin and Evil last night, and this is happening all over time with the Ouija board and all that stuff. Maybe that's maybe that's you. Maybe you're communicating with the dead and just make sure you say goodbye and don't do it in the graveyard. Now you're staying awake, trying to see ghosts, trying to talk to them, and this is not consistent with your family's beliefs. So you see here the changes in the behavior where now you're starting to feel like this is something that's really going on. So now over here, if we move on to full-blown psychosis, we see that this is causing significant distress and impairment. This The frequency is almost constant. You are convinced that it is real. There are drastic changes to your behavior and you are impaired in functioning. So right over here, you might see ghosts regularly um, on, you know, on the regs, daily, you know, rightly, nightly, seeing them ghosts, and you believe the dead are trying to communicate with you. You believe that, you know, th that you are some kind of spirit conduit. You are, you are extremely terrified of what's going on. On the flip side, you're, you're, you can think that like, you know, that whole spirit conduit thing is a gift 
and you're communicating with the ghosts day and night, you know, day and night. And then um, you're very distracted at work or in school. You're always seeing ghosts. You're always talking to ghosts. You know, you're seeing like, you know, it's like that movie, It Follows. You're looking down the hallway. The ghost is walking towards you. No one else can see the ghost, but the ghost keeps moving towards you. Your family's concerned. Your coworkers are concerned. Your loved ones are concerned about you, but you're convinced this is real. You've lost touch with reality. You're no longer doing reality testing. You're no longer checking to see what's real or what's not. You're convinced that these ghosts are going to come get you. That doesn't make sense. If you need more examples, come to office hours or send me an email. So let's talk about the diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia. Okay. Criterion A you need two or more of the following to be present for a significant portion of time during a one month period or less if you are successfully treated. And then at least one of these must be one of the first three symptoms. Two or more symptoms and one of them must be one of the first three symptoms. So that is delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech. So if I say you need Delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized speech, that's gonna be wrong. You need one of those. Can you have delusions and hallucinations? Yes. Can you have hallucinations and disorganized speech? Yes. Can you have delusions and disorganized speech? Yes. All right? Can you have disorganized speech and grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior? Yes. Can you have delusions and negative symptoms? Yes. That's still gonna be a that's that that'll be criteria. Can you have grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior and negative symptoms? No, right? Because you need one at least one, two, or three, right? At the same time. Okay, that's gonna be criterion A. That didn't make sense. Read this line, go to DSM-5, red box DSM-5. So criterion B, the level of functioning in one or more areas of life. This is gonna be work, relationships, or like your self-hygiene, is going to be markedly below the level achieved prior to onset. So this means that all of a sudden, I am not able to take care of myself. So here's why it, it this is here's why you have to think about the level of achievement prior to onset, because some people might have a lower functioning, a lower baseline functioning of the ability to maintain relationships, take care of themselves, right? That might already be lower. And so you wanna compare it to before this episode starts. You wanna see a precipitous decline. So it's not like, hey, this guy really can't take care of himself. Well, obviously he's never taken care of himself. So that's the, this is gonna be the distinction there. And then criterion C, you're gonna have continuous signs of the disturbance persistent for at least six months. This six month period must include at least one month of symptoms or less if it's successfully treated that meet criterion A. So that's the active phase symptoms and may include periods of prodromal or residual symptoms. So during these periods, the signs of the disturbance may be manifested by only negative symptoms or by two or more symptoms listed in criterion A, present in an attenuated form. This could be odd beliefs, unusual perceptual experiences. Go on to the online DSM-5. Check out that red box. It's gonna help you out. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about the prodromal phase and the residual phase. I'm being dead serious in this lecture when I talk about going to the online DSM-5, looking at all the criteria, all the symptoms, where they might express themselves. I know I've said this before and I'm gonna keep saying it. If you think that just by watching this lecture, you're gonna get all the information you need to be successful, you are sorely mistaken. These lectures, like I told you in the first week of class, these lectures are not all encompassing. They never were, they never will be. There's too much information. So there's just a, we just talk about some of the more complicated issues, try to break it down a little bit for you, try to give you some examples. But if you ever open up those DSM-5 chapters, if you ever watch some of those study videos, you will see these topics are very dense. And now I'm here to help you, I'm here to answer questions. But if you're not sending me emails, if you're not coming to office hours, if you're not going to the online DSM-5, which is actually free of charge, or I should say I had no additional charge, it's gonna be rough. I'm telling you now, I'm telling you now, because when quiz four rolls around, gonna be lackadaisical, then you're gonna be emailing me where do these questions come from, Walter? Well, I don't know, man. What do you think? So during the active phase, the person has significant impairment in one or more areas of social and occupational functioning, like work, interpersonal relationships, or self-care. So let's look at the prodromal phase. So this precedes the active phase of schizophrenia and is marked by an obvious deterioration in role functioning. So prodromal signs and symptoms are less dramatic than those seen in the active phase of the disorder 
and it can be difficult to tell whether someone is in the prodromal phase until after they've transitioned into an active phase. But researchers are still working to better identify an individual during the prodromal phase, like to try to help prevent this transition to the active phase. And then there's a residual phase. In the residual phase, this follows the active phase of schizophrenia. At this point, the psychotic symptoms have improved, but the person continues to be impaired in various ways. So for example, negative symptoms may be more pronounced during this phase. So during the entire disturbance, there's always going to be some impairment in functioning, like holding down a job, staying in school, and social functioning. There's three specifiers, mild, moderate, and severe. And the mild, moderate, and severity specifiers depends on the presentation of the symptoms and the severity of the symptoms. So how would you tell? The clinician's gonna have to figure that out. It's gonna be one of those gray areas based on where they were before and where they are now. You gotta figure out what's going on. I mean, it's difficult. There might be a more advanced way of doing that, but you know what you're gonna have to do? Go to the DSM-5, look it up. What, can, what do you want me to say? Oh. So let's do a little bit of review. So for a diagnosis of schizophrenia, someone must A, have two of the required five symptoms, B, have at least a six month period total containing the prodromal, or which has a one month active phase and residual phase, C, have delusions and or hallucinations, D, display intense paranoia that other people are out to get them, or E, all of the above. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna drink this coffee. Go ahead and figure it out for yourself. All right, boom, 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 boom. Let's go. All right, B, have at least a six month period total containing a prodromal, active phase, and residual phase. Okay, and then you're like, Walter, what about, what about, no, what about A? What, what, what? Have any two? Any two? What symptoms are I was talking about? What symptoms are I was talking about? We have five symptoms, right? But is it any of the two? No, 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 no. They need to have two or more, but they must at least have, one of those symptoms must be the one, two, or three, right? The delusions, hallucinations, and then the disorganized thinking, okay. More review for you. So a man described that he was an angel of God, and that he was sent on earth in order to be a warrior for Christ, to make decisions about who would be sent to heaven and who would be sent to hell. What type of experience does this best represent? A, an auditory hallucination. B, a religious delusion. C, a delusion of thought insertion. D, all of the above. E, none of the above, since this is a typical experience. What do you think it is? A ba bum bum boom B, a religious delusion. All right. If this is confusing to you, email office hours. All right, there we go. So now let's move on from symptoms. We're going to talk about differential diagnosis, and then we'll get into the rest of it. So hey, we're two-fifths of the way there. All right. I told you it was a long lecture. You didn't listen to me. You know, it was long. Buckle up. What do you want me to say? I mean, it's going to be a, it's going to be a marathon. You know, you're going to be binge watching this lecture. Do you know what I'm saying? So different Diagnosis. Before you can diagnose somebody with schizophrenia, we want to try to rule out disorders with similar symptoms. So you want to try to try to focus in and see what they have. So right over here, we have dif differential diagnosis. We have some disorders that are very similar to schizophrenia. And we'll talk about some of these in detail a little bit later. So we have brief psychotic disorder, schizophreniform disorder, mood disorders with psychotic features, and schizoaffective disorder. So those are going to be similar disorders to schizophrenia, which means they share an overlap in symptoms, but the presentation is going to be a little bit different. These disorders also include things like positive symptoms. They also include negative symptoms. So there might be a lot of these overlap in these symptoms between these different disorders. Uh, now, when I'm explaining the difference between these disorders, I'm going to be talking about episodes, both mood episodes and psychotic episodes and I'll be talking about frequency and duration. And so the differential diagnosis depends on the frequency and duration of episodes, and also if or when they overlap. All right, let's go ahead and talk about delusional disorder. So delusional disorder, individual with delusional disorder can never meet full criteria for schizophrenia. An individual with delusional disorder 
is going to have non-bizarre delusions. So these non-bizarre delusions are demonstrably incorrect beliefs that have persisted for more than one month. People with delusional disorder may appear fully functioning when not discussing the delusion. So the prognosis is mixed and tends to have a fluctuating, a fluctuating impact on the client's life. So typically psychosocial functioning is not always greatly impaired and their general behavior is neither obviously odd or bizarre. So remember that non-bizarre delusions could happen in real life. So let's think about some examples of this. All right, believe that you are being spied. So this is actually something that could happen in real life. You know, if you have an iPhone or you use Facebook, you can definitely be um, spied on. Thinking that someone is secretly in love with you, this is totally possible. Is this probable? Not really, but it's complete within the realm of possibility. That you have great or an unrecognized artistic talent, this is possible, but is it probable? Who knows? But it is something that could happen in real life. That your spouse is cheating on you despite lack of evidence, this is possible as well, but you don't really know. So remember that when we're looking at delusional disorder, this is the kind of dysfunction that you have here, the kind of symptoms you're experiencing are purely going to be non-bizarre delusions. So things like hallucinations, disorganized behavior, and negative symptoms are gonna be largely absent. I should say disorganized symptoms are gonna be All right, so I wanna take a little quick moment here and talk a little bit about the differences between possibility and probability when I'm talking about these bizarre versus non-bizarre delusions. When it comes to bizarre delusions, these are gonna be things that are impossible. No possibility of this happening. And non-bizarre, these things are possible. There is a possibility for this happening. So the examples that I gave for this slide right here, these are all things that are possible, but not very probable. Probable, so probability is the chances of something happening. You could have something that's that's very improbable, that there's a, like a low probability of this happening, and that doesn't mean that it's impossible. So for example, I might say, you know, where are the chances that an asteroid might hit the Earth? Well, you know, probably extremely low. Is it impossible for an asteroid to hit the Earth? No. Is it possible for an asteroid to hit the Earth and destroy the planet? No, it's not impossible. Is it unlikely? Yeah, it's probably extremely unlikely, extremely rare, and is a, probably a super Super low probability of this thing happening, but it doesn't mean that it's impossible. Here's a different example. What are the chances of me levitating off the ground and going super saiyan blue? You know, that's impossible. It's not going to happen. There's not even a probability of that happening. People don't levitate off the ground unassisted and people don't turn super saiyan blue. That's nonsense. It's made up. It's impossible. It's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. Never in the history of humanity will a human being levitate off the ground and go super saiyan blue. It's not going to happen. Trust me. You can quote me on that. And if that and if somebody in your lifetime ever levitates off the ground and goes super saiyan blue, you can just cancel me on Twitter as a liar, okay? It's not going to happen. It's impossible. Possible. So these are differences. So if I feel that there is going to be an asteroid that's going to hit the earth and kill everybody, that's going to be a non-bizarre delusion because it's possible that could happen, but it's not very probable that that's going to happen. And if I'm running around talking about how I'm going to levitate off the ground and go super saiyan blue and kamehameha everybody, that's a bizarre delusion. That's impossible. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. People don't levitate off the ground. People don't turn super saiyan blue. And if you don't know what anything I just said meant, office hours, send me an email. Largely absent in delusional disorder. All right, so right over here, we have schizophrenia, schizophreniform, and brief psychotic disorder. Brief psychotic disorder can last a day to a month. And this might be triggered by some sort of stressful event. Schizophreniform disorder lasts between one month and six months. And schizophrenia lasts at least six months. And remember, with schizophrenia, the active phase has to be at least one month. For schizophreniform and brief psychotic disorders, these are just two disorders that do not meet the minimum six month duration for schizophrenia. This is, so if you look at somebody who's having like schizophrenia like symptoms, but these haven't been going on for a long time, you might be looking at schizophreniform or brief psychotic disorders. Let's uh, focus in on schizophreniform a little more. So schizophreniform disorder is a psychotic disorder characterized by symptoms that meet all the criteria for schizophrenia, except the symptoms have been present for only one to six months and daily functioning may or may not have declined over that period of time. So there may or may not be a decrease in daily functioning. And if symptoms last six months, then you are upgraded to a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So brief psychotic disorder, this is going to be a psychotic disorder characterized by the sudden onset of positive or disorganized symptoms that last between a day and a month and are followed by full recovery. So negative symptoms are not present with this disorder. This disorder is marked by intense emotional episodes that make it difficult for the person to function 
and places the person at risk for suicide. And this disorder has a good prognosis for recovery. If you look at these arrows right here, you'll see I've arranged them by duration. So brief psychotic between one and 30 days, schizophreniform 30 to 180 days, schizophrenia more than 180 days. What's 180 days? 180 days is six months. Okay, there we go. What's six times 30? Come on, kids. Okay. So now let's move on here for a differential diagnosis. So someone with schizophrenia may experience symptoms of depression and mania, but they are relatively brief compared to the entire disorder. So schizoaffective disorder is a psychotic disorder characterized by the presence of both schizophrenia and depressive or manic episodes. More specifically, not only must a person meet criteria for mood episodes, the symptoms that meet criteria for a major mood episode must be present for the majority of the total duration of the active and residual portions of the illness. So in order to know that this is schizoaffective and that the primary diagnosis focuses on the psychotic features of the disorder, positive symptoms must be present for at least two weeks without prominent mood symptoms. In contrast, we compare this to a disorder that has psychotic symptoms, but instead the mood symptoms, that is depressive or manic symptoms, are the most prominent symptoms. So a person might have, a mood, might have mood episodes and psychotic symptoms or episodes, but in the case of this diagnosis, the psychotic symptoms must occur in the context of a major mood episode. So here's a little bit of a graph if that prior slide doesn't make sense to you or didn't make sense to you. And if this graph doesn't make sense to you, email office hours. So right over here, the top graph, we have schizophrenia. And as we see, the red are psychotic symptoms and then the yellow is mood symptoms. So as you see right here, I have a majority psychotic symptoms. And whenever mood symptoms are present, they coincide with the psychotic symptoms. Now let's move down. You'll see that I have schizoaffective disorder where I have a majority psychotic symptoms and then I have mood symptoms that are present at the same time as the psychotic symptoms. But if you'll notice, there are more periods of mood symptoms. And then on the bottom here, we have mood disorder with psychotic features. As you see here, I have both psychotic symptoms and mood symptoms, but I have a majority mood symptoms. And the psychotic symptoms only appear within a mood episode. Now that doesn't make sense. Send me an email, come to office hours. All right, so right here, when we're talking about the schizoaffective disorder, I use the word more, and I know for some people that's gonna be a huge hang up. So what I mean is there are more, more often than not, there are mood symptoms present with the psychotic symptoms. So take a look at schizophrenia. You'll see that I have psychotic symptoms, and then I do have mood symptoms that occur with the psychotic symptoms but more often than not, I just have psychotic symptoms. Then we go to schizoaffective disorder, you'll see that I have psychotic symptoms and I have mood symptoms. But look, from what I have shown here, looks like more often than not, my mood symptoms and psychotic symptoms co-occur. See what I'm saying there? So you have more mood symptoms, but that's that's very imprecise and that might trip people up. So for schizoaffective disorder, like more often than not, you're going to have mood symptoms and psychotic symptoms. Now, for mood disorder with psychotic features, you'll see that this is an individual who criteria for a mood disorder. So we're talking about major depressive disorder or bipolar one or two. And then you see the psychotic symptoms occur, but they only occur within the context of the mood disorders. And you'll notice here that I have a majority mood disorders. So compared to schizoaffective, where I have majority psychotic symptoms with mood or with psychotic features, I have majority mood symptoms. And remember, these psychotic features only occur within a mood episode. Okay. And if that doesn't make sense, email office hours or go to the dsm-5 chapter and look it up so we got some review here what is the difference between uh mood disorders with psychosis schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder okay so you have three disorders here right we have mood disorders with psychosis schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder Let's go ahead and go, go through the options right here. All right, so we have option A, the duration and mood of psychotic symptoms. Option B, the type of delusion and presence or absence of other symptoms. Option C, the duration of the entire disturbance. Option D, the number and frequency of psychotic symptoms. Option E, there are no differences. All right, there we go. We'll go ahead and see what the answer is. Boom, the answer is A. 
the duration of mood and psychotic symptoms. So once again, think about mood disorders. Mood disorders, I have primarily um, mood disorders and psychosis. I'm gonna have mood episodes and the psychosis episodes are gonna be within my mood episodes. For schizophrenia, remember this is a longer duration for the symptoms. And then for schizoaffective, this is going to be the schizophrenia symptoms or the psychotic symptoms in addition to the mood symptoms. All right, make sure you go to DSM-5. Okay, so now we have some more here for you. So what is the difference between schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder, and brief psychotic disorder? Let's take a look right here. Is it A, the duration of mood and psychotic symptoms? B, the type of delusion and presence, absence for other symptoms. C, the duration of the entire disturbance. D, the number and frequency of psychotic symptoms. E, there are no differences. Let's take a look right here. Okay. Boom, the answer is C, the duration of entire disturbance. If you, that is making sense to you, then uh, uh, go ahead and send me an email. All right, so right here we have a little game that we play, but we're not gonna do it that way. Now we're just gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and walk you through this. So uh, which disorder goes in each box? Number one, mood disorder, psychosis. Number two, schizoaffective disorder. Number three, schizophrenia. Number four, brief psychotic disorder. Number five, schizophreniform. So what we're gonna do here, so this is a part of the video that also tripped some people up last semester. The way this works, this is like a decision tree. Like for example, like right over here, right? This is the question that we're asking. If the answer is yes, then we go to the next box. If the answer is no, then we would have the disorder right here. So I have five disorders. We have mood disorder, psychosis, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, brief psychotic disorder, and schizophreniform disorder. And so the way we're gonna play the game, I read this. If it's yes, we go to the next box. If it's no, that's the answer. So right here, yes, go to the next box. No, that's the answer. Right here, yes. That's the answer, no, go to the next box. Right here, yes, we have an answer, no, we have an answer. So that's how this is gonna work. This trip people up. I had people clogged up in office hours who didn't understand this. It's possible, not probable, that you can pause this video and replay this section multiple times. It's totally possible. It's totally possible. So I would encourage you to pause the video, Rewatch this a few times if you're not getting it. And then if you're still not getting it, come to office hour, send me an email, let's talk about it. I'm just gonna leave this up here for a quick second. Just press pause the video, whatever. And then I'm going to walk you through this. So right over here, this is your little um, flow chart, your little decision tree. Um, we'll start with these statements and we'll go through and see what goes in each box. So did psychotic symptoms occur at times other than during mood episodes? Well, if the answer is no, you would choose mood disorder psychosis. If the answer is yes, then you go to the next start part, which is, has duration of mood episodes been brief relative to the duration of schizophrenia symptoms? So this includes negative symptoms and odd beliefs. So the answer is no, you would go for two, schizoaffective disorder. So if the answer is yes, it goes, has duration of schizophrenia symptoms been six months or longer? If the answer is yes, you're gonna choose schizophrenia. If the answer is no, <coughs> you go to the next one, which is, has the duration of schizophrenia symptoms been at least one month? If the answer is no, Brief psychotic disorder, answer is yes, schizophreniform. Now, does it make sense? Email office hours. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and move on to talk about etiology and course of schizophrenia, then we'll finish up with epidemiology and treatments. So before we get into that, let's go ahead and do some quick review. So for the past two months, Sandra's speech has become incoherent and she jumps from topic to topic in an incomprehensible manner. Her affect is flat and she is socially withdrawn. These symptoms began about three months ago, one month before her unusual speech. Sandra has a history of one major press episode from two years ago, but this was the first time she has experienced these symptoms. What diagnosis would we give her at this time? Okay, so is it A, mood disorder with psychotic features, B, schizoaffective disorder, C, schizophreniform disorder, D, schizophrenia, E, none of the above. All right, let's take a look. Bam, 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 boom, schizophreniform disorder. Now, why is it schizophreniform disorder? All right, let's think about the symptoms. Let's think about the length of time she's had the, these symptoms. Okay, how? what's the length of time I need for schizophrenia? Six months. All right, we're not there yet. Let's keep it moving. Teddy has felt really high energy and on top of the world over the last month. 
With this high energy, he has also has a belief that he has special abilities, such as the ability to fly and the ability to read other people's minds. Teddy's belief in his ability to fly was so strong that he jumped through the window and needed to be hospitalized. These unusual beliefs, while he is manic, is not new, but he has never had unusual beliefs when he has felt depressed. He has also never had these experiences when he has been in a normal mood state. What diagnosis does Teddy likely have? Okay. A, mood disorder psychotic features. B, schizoaffective disorder. C, schizophreniform disorder. D, schizophrenia. E, none of the above. You already know what I'm gonna do. It's A, mood disorder psychotic features. That's because he has these psychotic features. He doesn't have them when, unless they're compared with a mood disorder or a mood episode. And it looks like for a while here, he's had some issues, okay? It looks like with his, these highs and lows, you can look at somebody who maybe has major depressive disorder, maybe has bipolar disorder, but it doesn't sound like this person's primary complaint is the psychotic features. And psychotic features do not present themselves without the mood symptoms. If that doesn't make sense, email office hours. All right, so for the etiology of schizophrenia, uh, there is no one direct cause or pathway to schizophrenia. It is a combination of things. And everybody who has schizophrenia um, has developed it in some unique way. So I wouldn't be able to say like, you know, there's one way to get schizophrenia. So some of these causes, we're gonna talk about more on their own slides uh, with additional information, but I do want to provide some information about uh, some additional causes that have been linked with a later onset of schizophrenia. So in addition to genetics, there are some other etiological factors present at birth that relates to later schizophrenia. This includes maternal exposure to virus and complications or illness during pregnancy. So you, you should remember this when we start talking about schizotypal personality disorder. So here are some other things that might occur uh, during pregnancy that might lead to some complications. So you have fetal hypoxia, you have prenatal infection with a maternal viral infection, you have um, elevated risk for individuals born shortly after flu epidemics or after being prenatally exposed to certain viral infections during the second trimester of pregnancy. Well, the seasonal exposure to this is most common in late fall, early winter, and the season of birth has effects on onset. Also brain abnormalities that have been found. This includes large ventricles in the brain, which can be related to other areas of the brain being smaller. There are also neurotransmitter differences, particularly in dopamine. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later. And this is in addition to social factors like socioeconomic status and um, family environment. So let's do a little bit of review. Eight months ago, Melvin was discharged from the hospital after medications effectively treated his active psychotic episode that lasted for two weeks. Even though the medications have significantly helped, he still has flattened affect and wonders if other people are trying to plot against him. Which of the following disorders can we rule out based on this information alone? All right. A, schizophreniform, B, schizoaffective, C, schizophrenia, D, we cannot rule out any of these disorders, E, we, we would rule out all these disorders. Let's take a look right here. It is A, schizophreniform disorder. So remember with schizophreniform disorder, you have these symptoms, but daily functioning might not have decreased. So right over here, Melville is actually in the hospital, which means that his symptoms were severe enough to require hospitalization and he was prescribed medication. So we can go ahead and rule out schizophreniform disorder because Melvin had experienced a, a serious psychotic episode, which is why he was hospitalized. Now we can't uh, rule out schizophrenia because remember, even though it's only been two weeks, there's a caveat in the diagnosis of schizophrenia. If there's, your symptoms are severe enough to where you are hospitalized and successfully treated, you can be diagnosed with schizophrenia. Okay, boom. Now that makes sense. Go to DSM-5, look at that red box, come to office hours, send me an email. All right, now adoption studies have shown that children of parents with schizophrenia when adopted the way to a different environment still have the same lifetime risk of getting schizophrenia. They still have the same lifetime risk of getting schizophrenia as children of people with schizophrenia who were not adopted away. So within with twin studies, we see that there is a higher concordance rate of schizophrenia and monozygotic twins rather than dizygotic twins, which suggests that genes do play a decent sized role in the etiology of schizophrenia. But because 48% of it's far lower than 100%, we can also assume that the environmental factors play some role in the onset of schizophrenia. So there's a little note here. Let's talk about these uh, quadruplets. These are the Janine quadruplets. And so they are supposedly monozygotic twins, but they don't look like they are. And they exhibit different symptoms of schizophrenia and they have different onset. So their case illustrates the effects of non-shared environments. All right, so let's 
let's do this. Let's look at proband studies for schizophrenia. So remember, a proband is a person serving as a starting point for the genetic study of a family, right? It's the first person who has symptoms, the first person with a disorder that seeks treatment. So let's think if a proband has schizophrenia. So is the risk of first degree relatives having schizophrenia um, higher or lower than a general population? Let's we'll take a look right here. All right, so what's the general risk? All right, general population is 1%. First degree relatives, 50%, much higher. All right, so let's say the proband has schizophrenia. Is the relative risk of third degree relatives um, having schizophrenia higher than general population or lower? Yep, see, it's still higher. All right, so we know that genes play a role in schizophrenia. So for example, children born to older fathers who are 45 years or older are three times more likely to develop schizophrenia than children born to fathers between the ages of 20 and 24. Uh, researchers think that there's a mutation in sperm produced by older men that might be the culprit for this. Researchers are trying to identify the specific genes that cause schizophrenia. And so researchers um, have found that mutated genes um, might be responsible for the symptoms of agitation involved with schizophrenia. Now, a family history of the disorder is the strongest predictor, but 85% of people with a parent or sibling with a disorder do not develop schizophrenia. Now of twins, 46 to 53 percent develop schizophrenia, indicating that there must be other factors that lead to the development of this disorder, even though both twins have the same predisposition. See, since heritability is not 100 percent and doesn't tell the whole story, what are some environmental factors that might contribute to the development of schizophrenia symptoms? All right, so one of these is parenting style. So there was a Finnish study that compared adopted children with a biological mother with schizophrenia and a control group. Now of adopted children who had mothers with schizophrenia, those who were raised in a dysfunctional home were more likely to develop schizophrenia than those adopted into a non-dysfunctional home. Thus, quality parenting seems to protect children from developing schizophrenia. Let's talk about neurotransmitters for a second. Dopamine has been associated with schizophrenia. So studies have found that low numbers of dopamine receptors in frontal lobes and the increased production of dopamine are both associated with risks for schizophrenia. Antipsychotic drugs that are prescribed to individuals with schizophrenia target dopamine and they block postsynaptic dopamine receptors. The dopamine hypothesis is the view that schizophrenia arises from an overproduction of dopamine or an increase in the number or sensitivity of dopamine receptors. And this triggers unrelated thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. So delusions are an attempt to organize these unrelated thoughts. Support for this hypothesis comes from research on dopamine reducing medications, which decrease the positive symptoms, and also from studies on people without schizophrenia who take LSD and report schizophrenia-like symptoms. Dopamine affects and is affected by other neurotransmitters. There are several other neurotransmitters that play an important role role in schizophrenia. So there's research on serotonin, GABA, and glutamate, and that focus on how they interact with dopamine pathways in the brain to result in schizophrenia. So dopamine, we're talking about all these neurotransmitters and everything. This is called psychopharmacology. You are um, especially interested in the way all of this works. There's a lot of different resources out there for psychopharmacology. You might want to go to search.proquest.com scholar.google.com, look up psychopharmacology, go to the online DSM-5, type that in, and, uh, you know, dive in with your heart's content. So outside the purview or the content of this course, I do not know a lot about psychopharmacology. I've got to be honest with you. When it comes to genetics, when it comes to psychopharmacology, heck, there's a bunch of disorders I don't know a lot about. So is out, a lot, of, a lot of things are outside of my wheelhouse, so psychopharmacology would be one of them. So I can help you enough to get a, get you a good start for what you need for the quiz, for what you would need to you know look somewhere else, but if you wanna dive into the weeds with psychopharmacology, I encourage you to seek out other resources. Um, Search.proquest.com, scholar.google.com. Okay, psychopharmacology. The neurotransmitter system plays a very important role in supporting activities involved with working memory. So deficits in attention might be associated with dopamine dysregulation. So with through deficits in attention, we wanna think about how an individual might distinguish relevant from irrelevant stimuli. So for example, if I'm talking to someone, they only need to cross their legs or scratch their head. They become easily distracted and forget what they were saying. So working memory is what we use to temporarily hold information in our minds as we complete tasks. 
tasks. So this is kind of like mental sticky notes. So working memory problems are often manifested in disorganized speech by not being able to hold on to immediately relevant information and going off track. And researchers have suggested that working memory deficits are present long before the onset of schizophrenia. For example, children who later receive a diagnosis of schizophrenia are more likely to have been impaired on tests of verbal working memory than are siblings who do not develop the disorder. Now, executive functions are mental processes involved in planning, organizing, problem solving, abstract thinking, and good judgment. Abstract thinking is interesting because one way that schizophrenia is assessed for is to read well-known proverbs to patients and ask them the underlying meaning of the proverb, even if they were not immediately familiar with the proverb. If someone struggled with this, they might either have given up or provided an answer or responded very literally. So if someone was asked, the apple never falls from the tree. Well, apples grow on trees, so then they fall right there. Socioeconomic status is also an environmental factor that might play a role in the etiology of schizophrenia. So there are two pathways for this to happen. You have hypothesis one, which is social causation. So negative factors related to socioeconomic status, this is like stressful life events, social isolation, poor nutrition, lead to development of an illness. So you are poor and therefore stressed, and then you get schizophrenia. And then there's hypothesis two, social selection. So this is also referred to as downward drift. So due to social or cognitive impairments in those who develop the illness, they are less able to progress to college or high paying jobs, and so they drift to a lower social economic status. So you have schizophrenia, you cannot climb up in academic, vocational, and social ladders, then you become poor. Evidence exists that supports both views. All right, let's do some quick review. Hadley's family didn't have much money while she was growing up. Hadley sometimes went without enough food and without proper health care. As an adult, Hadley developed schizophrenia. Hadley's case could potentially provide support for which etiological hypothesis for schizophrenia? A, the dopamine hypothesis, B, the social selection hypothesis, C, the executive function hypothesis, D, the social causation hypothesis, or E, the null hypothesis? The correct answer is D, the social causation hypothesis. So now we're gonna to go to epidemiology. All right, let's talk about that real quick. So I had really good conversations in the in-person discussion session um, talking about how socioeconomic status is kind of like related to mental health outcomes. And th these things are all like related by like maybe socioeconomic status can cause this to happen or maybe your mental health issues cause you to have a certain socioeconomic status. And then also kind of talking about um, what do people deserve? Do you know, like does somebody with schizophrenia deserve to be poor? You know, does somebody with an alcohol use disorder deserve to be destitute? Does somebody who's addicted to methamphetamine, do they deserve to be, you know, do they deserve everything that happens to them? You know, so like there's a way that our society functions where we look at somebody who's successful and we think, well, that person has made all the right choices and we um, negate maybe how there are some system uh, systemic barriers, some structural barriers in place to maybe keep people out of certain jobs. I was watching a, a documentary yesterday about the Myers-Briggs personality test when we'll get to that, uh, I think next week. You know, they were talking about how the Myers-Briggs personality test is actually not even the Myers-Briggs personality test. So a lot of companies have taken these personality tests because none of it was trademarked or copyrighted and they've slapped the name on there and they put it into their business and say, hey, you're an ENTJ, you're an IFL, whatever, you know, all those little letters, right? Well, that's not even based off the original Myers-Briggs test anymore. These companies companies have co-opted it because they can, because it's not copywritten or there's, there's no trademark. So they can just put these letters in and make you think that it's a real thing. And then they can do that to determine who gets to work in their companies and who doesn't. So even if it says that you're like the leader type, they know that people want to be the leader type. So then they'll increase the results to favor the leader type, even though they've identified that you're more easily manipulated and you're more likely to do what they have to do. So then they kind of like, you know, change things around so you feel like, hey, I'm a leader, but now you're just another cog in the machine. This is a way people are kind of being manipulated into different avenues, into different lanes. This also happens with other disorders as well. So like with those personality tests, maybe they can screen you out if you have like depression or anxiety or other kind of disorders that they don't want to have to deal with. And then this also happens in our society where we label people, we stigmatize them. So if you're a meth addict, you're a dirty meth head. You know, you're a poor meth person, you're danger to society, you're going to rob, you're going to steal, you deserve to be in jail. You know, you're a drunk, you're dangerous, you're driving around drunk, you're a menace to society, you should be locked up. Uh, this guy's dangerous, he has psychosis, he's a dangerous person. We got to get rid of this person. We got to lock him up. We got to get him off the streets. Look at that homeless person. Why is he yelling? Why is he yelling at nobody? This person doesn't, this person made all the wrong decisions in their life. That's why they're on the street. And look at this guy over here. Look at him. He's doing great. He has no issues. He made all the right choices. Or maybe he was just born without any of these issues rather than, you know, demonizing people who struggle with mental health. Maybe we should try to figure out how to help them out. So this is not a 
political class, so I won't get into all the politics behind all of that. But there are some arguments to be made that as psychologists, we're complicit in some of these labels, and not just complicit in the labels, because remember, we're categorizing people with symptoms to try to get them the right kind of treatment, but also we're kind of putting a judgment call on certain treatments for certain people. You know, we're putting a judgment call on what's like, you know, like who's a good person and who's a bad person. And there's a way that we can research people, we can diagnose people, we can find out what's troubling them and then help them out without stigmatizing them. And so because of all these different social issues, these different social causes uh, that are going on, it might be important for you to think about those of you who are actually interested in being medical doctors or psychologists to think about how society treats individuals with certain diagnoses and how you can be a part of destigmatizing these mental health issues and helping individuals to gain access to the help that they need, to the treatment that they need, and not just running to what's quick and easy by labeling people as being, you know, deviants, as labeling people as being criminals, as labeling people as just me making poor decisions, and start to think about what choice did this individual have in their disorder? What choice did they have with being born with this certain diathesis and encountering the certain stress that causes mental health issue to occur. To really think about that and to stop like putting other people down, propping yourself up because things worked out for you and things didn't work out for them. Just kind of think about that. That's a uh, that's uh, just just something to think about as we go through this material. Then we're going to finish up with treatments for schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is rare but disabling. And schizophrenia has a high comorbidity with substance use disorders. 60% of those with schizophrenia have some substance use problem that is not related to tobacco. Now, when we look at the prevalence of schizophrenia, less than 1% of the population will develop schizophrenia at some point in their lives. In developed nations, schizophrenia is one of the top five causes of disability. So in the United States, about 5% of people with schizophrenia are homeless and 6% are in jail or prison. The course of schizophrenia varies widely. There's generally a slow, gradual development of various symptoms, and not everyone with schizophrenia will deteriorate and function over time. So some people will have exacerbations and remissions and others are going to remain chronically ill. In terms of long-term prognosis for individuals with schizophrenia, one-third improve, one-third stay the same, and about one-third become disabled. So females are equally likely as males to be affected by schizophrenia. However, there are some sex differences that do exist. So males have an earlier age of onset, which is typically between the ages of 18 to 25, whereas the onset for females is a little bit later. Now, females typically have a good pre-morbid social functioning. In other words, their social functioning prior to the onset of schizophrenia tends to be very good and they have a better response to treatment, whereas males often have poor pre-morbid social functioning and more chronic course of illness. Now, males typically have more negative symptoms, whereas females typically experience more positive symptoms, such as hallucinations and paranoia, and they express more outward emotion compared to males with schizophrenia. Now, the course of schizophrenia for males is often more chronic than the course for females, and males typically have a poor response to treatment than females. So now there's a little bit of a quick review right here for you. So which statement is true about sex differences in schizophrenia. A, males are twice as likely as females to develop schizophrenia. B, females have an earlier age of onset of schizophrenia than males. Lifetime prevalence rates of schizophrenia are the same in males and females. Females display more negative symptoms of schizophrenia than males. Toxic masculinity causes males to overreport symptoms of schizophrenia. All right, which one is it? A, B, C, or D, or E? Ooh, boom, there we go. It is C. Lifetime prevalence rates of schizophrenia are the same in males and females. All righty, don't let me trick you there. So before we move on, which one of the following states statements do you believe about schizophrenia? All right, which one do you believe is the most true? Most people with schizophrenia end up homeless. Most people with schizophrenia are violent. People with schizophrenia are at high risk of suicide. I believe all of these are equally true about schizophrenia. I believe none of these are true about schizophrenia. This is just what do you believe? What have you heard? What have you been told? So right here has some numbers. We have about 2.5 million Americans with schizophrenia. We often have a stereotype that people with schizophrenia always end up homeless. While this is a reality for many individuals with this disorder, it is not the only outcome. So more more than half are either able to live independently, and this actually includes living with themselves, a family member or a spouse, or living with a close relative. So we see that about 135,000 are incarcerated, 165,000 are in a nursing home, 100,000 are hospitalized, 100,000 are homeless or in a shelter, 750,000 are living independently, 550,000 are living with a relative, and 400,000 are living in supervised group homes. Uh, there's a variety of outcomes for what might happen with an individual who has schizophrenia. Now, schizophrenia exists across cultures in relatively similar rates. However, 
within cultures, people in certain urban areas or of social lower socioeconomic classes and those who are black are more likely to develop schizophrenia. And this could be from situations that they're living in, but also the over diagnoses of schizophrenia in certain populations. So with suicide, so 10 to 15% of people who have schizophrenia die by suicide, which places those with the disorder at a higher risk of death by suicide than other people. The paranoid subtype is a subtype with the highest rate of suicide. Uh, risk factors for suicide include awareness of symptoms and effects, few negative symptoms, and pronounced positive symptoms. Cognitive deficits, particularly in executive functioning, may be related to poor judgment, which might explain some of the increased um, deaths by suicide. So risk factors for violence include the male sex, uh, comorbid substance abuse, medication on compliance, and criminal or psychopathic history. So less than 10% of violent acts are caused by people with schizophrenia, and most of those that commit those violent acts also abuse drugs and alcohol. So people with psychotic disorder are 20% more likely to be victims of violence. So why do you think this might be? Well, it could be because of some of the symptoms could cause individuals to get into more arguments. Some of their behaviors might be deemed as disrespectful. This might lead to more problems. And then when we look at race and ethnicity, African Americans are twice as likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, especially if you're an African American male. So now we're going to go ahead and talk about treatment. This is going to be our final segment here. So for treatments, let's first talk about antipsychotic medications. Older antipsychotics were made to target dopamine receptors. This worked well for positive symptoms, and it was somewhat effective for about 75% of patients. However, these did in induce side effects resembling Parkinson's disease. So you'd have um, extra pyramidal symptoms, you have tremors, agitation, voluntary posturing, motor rigidity and inertia. You would have tardive dyskinesia. This is involuntary movements of the mouth and face, like lip puckering, chewing, and spasmodic body movements. And some of these older antipsychotics, Thorazine and Halidol. Thorazine was first and it blocked dopamine, which decreased the positive symptoms. Tardive dyskinesia did not actually go away after getting off medications. The effects of tardive dyskinesia could be reduced by other medications. So those are 25% relapse on tra traditional drugs versus 65 to 80% of those who weren't on drugs. So by relapse, we mean relapse into psychotic symptoms. So there's a lower rate of relapse, which means that the medication was effective. So when think about medication compliance, we see that medication is actually very important. Only 40% of individuals relapse if they continue the medication and 60 to 75% will, will relapse if they discontinue the medication. And this is within the first year after being prescribed the medication. So at a two year interval, even in the best case scenario, those who do not use or do not continue the medication uh, will relapse. So newer studies actually debate w whether um, antipsychotics are better at treating negative symptoms. So for example, we think about some of the side effects that um, like clozapine might have, which has like a 1% chance of lethal of a lethal blood condition. Also some effects on other neurotransmitters like serotonin and norepinephrine. Relapse rates are high if medication stops and some relapse occurs even if medication is continued. And patients are more compliant with these newer antipsychotics as compared to the older antipsychotics due to less side effects and less motor problems. One of the side effects is weight gain and obesity. These newer antipsychotics are typically called atypical antipsychotics and they induce less of the Parkinson-like symptoms. And studies debate whether, these are whether or not these are better at treating negative symptoms. So these kind of medications include clozapine, risperidol, zyprexia, and seroquel. Some other forms of treatment on schizophrenia involve psychosocial functioning. So although decreasing severity of symptoms in schizophrenia is important and is not the only treatment consideration, medication does not meet many of the client's needs, such as improving social competence, improving housing stability, employment, etc. Being able to integrate the patient back into the community through some symptom medicine management skills, daily living skills, and social skills needs to also be considered. So research has suggested teaching families how to cope with schizophrenia can also uh, lessen the likelihood of adverse outcomes. So that is a big goal for psychosocial treatments. The type of treatments available are family therapy, social skills training, vocational rehabilitation, and assertive community training. Assertive community training or ACT is a community-based treatment program that combines education, support, skills training, rehabilitation, and medication dispersed. The goal is to keep seriously disordered patients in the community and then decrease the need for hospitalization. So from a publication by Gerber and Prince 1999, they gave an example of the goals of ACT. In addition to addressing clinical symptoms, the teams support clients in activities of daily living, such as shopping, cooking, personal hygiene, budgeting, and transportation. Team members help clients use their time constructively in leisure, locational and social pursuits. Families and community agencies with which clients are involved receive team support. Funds are available to help the team prevent unnecessary admissions to the hospital, and funds are used for emergency housing, groceries, and clothing. With ACT outcomes, you usually get a reduced rate of hospitalization 
medication, a reduced rate of relapse and psychotic symptoms, an increased use of mental health services, has also been shown to increase medication compliance, and clients actually um, report greater satisfaction with their care with ACD programs. So as you see right here, we have a list of all the different team members involved, uh, psychiatrists, nurses, social workers, vocational counselors, rec recreational counselors. They all kind of work together to try to rehabilitate the individual and reintegrate them to society. So which neurotransmitter has been proposed to play an especially large role in the onset of schizophrenia? Is it A, oxytocin, B, serotonin, C, norepinephrine, D, dopamine, E, acetylcholine? All right, think about it. What you got, what you got, what you got? Boom, dopamine. That is going to be neurotransmitter that has been proposed to play an especially large role in the onset of schizophrenia. Remember the dopamine hypothesis. All right. So we also have cognitive behavioral therapy for psychosis. So the goals here are going to decrease conviction of delusional beliefs, promote more effective coping strategies, and reduce distress. So one of the ways this works is to teach a client skills in challenging and modifying their beliefs through experimental reality testing. Now this treatment, CBT, is, is effective. It's actually superior to control in clinical studies. It significantly decreases positive symptoms, and you have continued improvement at six-month follow-up. This has been very effective. So one of the ways you want to do the experimental reality testing is by trying to challenge these beliefs as beliefs, as we talked about before, try to provide alternate evidence, and also try to teach the client how to reason the way through it. And there is the end of this lecture. Um, you have questions, go ahead and send me an email, email wjv3 at illinois.edu. That's it. That's going to be the end of this lecture. All right. Have a good one. Just like I said throughout the video, make sure you're taking these practice questions seriously. Please don't cheat. You're only cheating yourself. Please do your own work. If you're having problems, you have any questions, please come to office hours. Please, at the very least, send me an email with Psych 238 in the title. You'll come to the in-person discussion sessions if you can. For those who do show up to in-person discussion sessions. I mean, they do have a good time only because they can ask some deeper questions. And also if you're on, if you come to office hours, you know, you can ask questions really easy. You don't have to have your camera on, but you could ask questions in the chat. You could just listen to what other people are saying and learn from that. But make sure you're going through the DSM-5 and checking things out. Uh, yeah, I just really, I'd love to help you to get the grade that you want. You're gonna have to earn that grade. You're not just gonna get it just because you watch lecture. I mean, that's, that's the path to a C. I just want to encourage you to put some work in, ask some questions, you know, take care, take advantage of the resources offered to you. So that's going to be the it for this lecture. We're going to have some more interesting lectures coming up the rest of the semester. We have three more quizzes left and we have the next part of the assignment. So just uh, send me an email if you need some help. There we go. All right. Peace, peace, peace. Take it easy.